Thank you, Simone, for the prayer. Good morning and echoing uh, Tash and Kate and Dan and Maritza and everyone else. If you are joining us for the first time, welcome. If you have joined us previously, welcome back. Now, for those of you who don't know me, my name is Yongshin, or more commonly known as Pastor Yoshi, and I am one of the pastors here at the One Turner Seventh Day Adventist Church. Um, I was just monitoring the chat. There are three things I want to mention. Um, firstly, I know I've said welcome to everyone, but there is somebody special I kind of need to welcome. That's Julie, who is tuning into our live stream from London. And it's like, what, 2.30 a.m. right now. So Julie, welcome. Two other things I want to mention. It is babies galore today. Uh, my wife and I... We do not have an announcement to make, though she has been dreaming about puppies. I don't know how I feel about that. We will see. And finally, Liz mentioned uh, that apparently, Dan, uh, your baby face is missed. You know, I'm actually thinking of growing this. Um, we'll see how we go. Probably take me about eight years to get to where Dan is at, but we'll see. Uh, before we get into our message for today, I need to make a uh, disclaimer. Disclaimer is not the right word. Warning, warning, maybe warning. Yeah, uh, not quite. Let's 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 go with um, let's go with notice. Let's go with notice. So on this Saturday morning, uh, what happened last week may possibly happen again. What do I mean? There is literally a house being built next door. So last week I wasn't preaching, I could mute my microphone, as long as Dan's audio was coming through fine, but obviously I'm preaching today. So if you hear some banging and all of that, you'll know why. You know, with um, all the uh, equipment upgrade, I'm still waiting for a couple more lights, man. Yeah. Australia Post, I feel for them. They're just taking forever to come, um, and then we can, you know, get the lighting finally right. But there's one thing we haven't done, we haven't soundproofed the room yet. And to do that, that means we need to buy more stuff. I'm looking at my wife, she is frowning, she is... Yep, guys, you're gonna have to put up with the sound, sorry. The end. <laughs> now, jokes aside, uh, jokes aside, I am picking on Nadia, she has been nothing but supportive. She's smiling now, so honey, can we, can we buy more stuff? No, yeah, no, 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 you gotta put up with the noise. That's it, that's it. <laughs> um, before we get into the message for today, one more thing. Um, I want to get into our kids' word search segment. If you can't already tell, if you're tuning in, we love our kids here at One Turner Church. Uh, this is an additional thing that we have started since we've been live streaming. Here is the word search puzzle. Now, we apologize that we didn't link the document in the newsletter properly. So parents, you might want to take a photo. I'll get out of your way a little bit. Um, and they can probably use some app to circle the words on the photo as you find them. Now, if you're wondering, you know, what app to use and you don't know what to do, parents, that's easy. Just ask your kids. They know more than you, I'm pretty sure. And of course, we have the four words. Choice, Christian, Grace, and Prophecies. The four words that we will use in our message for today. And as we come closer to coming back to church, I think I will award a prize to the person, to the kid who gets the closest to the word count. So kids, now's your chance to practice. Okay, that's all the preliminary stuff out of the way. Uh, I want to get into our message for today. Thank you, Simone, for the prayers. I usually just like to have another prayer before we start. I invite you to bow your heads as we pray. Father in heaven, we just want to thank you, Lord, that we can come together on this Saturday morning, the day we call the Sabbath, to worship together via this live stream. May you just lead us. May you just guide us. My prayer remains the same, that you would uh, hide the messenger behind the message and behind the cross of Calvary, that any and all glory goes back to you and to you alone. I ask that you would open our hearts and open our minds as we open your words. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen and amen. 
Okay, church, we are starting a brand new sermon series uh, called the I Am Series. It's specifically based in the Gospel of John, where Jesus makes seven I Am declarations, and here they are. So he starts off by saying in John 6, I am the bread of life. He says, I am the light of the world in John 8 and John 9. Then he says, I am the gate. And in John chapter 10, he says, I am the good shepherd. In John chapter 11, he says, I am the resurrection and the life. In John 14 verse 6, he says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And in John chapter 15 verses 1 to 5, he says, I am the true vine. So, these are the seven I am statements by Jesus. We will explore each of them uh, each week. You know, some of these make sense. Things like, you know, I'm the resurrection and the life. Sure, that makes sense. But truth be told, some of these are kind of funny sayings. I mean, who says, I am the bread of life? I mean, you can probably put two and two together. Well, Jesus said these things and over the course of May and June and probably spilling a little bit over into July, we're going to take a seven part series to cover these statements. We'll have other guest preachers in between the series. That's why it's going to take longer than seven weeks. So watch this space. Today's sermon, however, uh, serves more as an introduction to the entire series. So consider this as part zero, if you must, and we'll start parts one to seven next week. What I want to do today is I want to look at the statement, I am itself. Now, what do I mean? Now, I actually covered this uh, in One Turner Church more than two years ago now, we did a sermon series called Pictures of Jesus. And as I was discussing this new sermon series with Dan uh, a few weeks back as we were planning for it, I thought I have to cover this again. Just call it a, a preamble, a part zero. Because this statement is actually quite different from all the other I am statements. I'm going to show you a verse in just a moment, but I am talking specifically about the discourse between Jesus and the Pharisees. They're debating back and forth about the Abrahamic roots, about how they're Abraham's children. And then Jesus just basically you know, throws down the gauntlet and it's like, boom, this is what he says. He says, before Abraham was, I am. And all the Jews are like, oh no, he didn't. Now, as if, as if that wasn't clear enough, Jesus makes it even clearer in John chapter 10, where he says, I and my Father are one. Now, Jesus makes this bold claim that he is God. You know, um, if you've heard someone make that claim, you'd be like, Man, the dudes, dudes lost it. This guy is cray cray, man. Cray cray means crazy, for those of you that don't speak young people, because I do, because I'm so woke. Cringe. <laughs> okay, moving on, moving on, moving on. Now, the thing is, this, the fact is, this I am statement is pretty out there. In fact, the Jews were actually angry. They said, hang on, this is blasphemy. Uh, blasphemy is not a word we use these days, but what that word basically means for the Jews is, we're going to kill you. That statement was really out there back then. But if you bring it into today's context, it seems something that you could readily dismiss. I mean... I mean, you could say, yeah, Jesus said that. He said he was God. But, you know, whatevs. It's actually a lot more significant than you realize. Now, I want to show you a short clip from abcnews.com. Now, this is about nine years old. You can see the full clip in our live stream video description when it's published. I'm just going to play the first three minutes. And it's not in high definition. It was like nine years ago. 
These are all people claiming to be God, claiming to be Jesus. They basically saying, I am, I am the father, I am the father of one. Well, take a look and tell me what you think. The matter of faith. There have been men, many of them, who claim to be a new Messiah. And tonight we're going to meet three of them, including one in the faraway Philippines who has amassed a flock, he says, numbers in the millions. Poor people who give what little they have to the man they believe is the second coming of Jesus. Bill Weir journeyed there to meet him. Throughout the Bible, prophets, angels, and Jesus himself all promised that the Son of God would return to create heaven on earth. And throughout the ages, billions of Christians have wondered, when? But what if the second coming is here, now? There are a number of would-be messiahs who claim exactly that, and few are more physically convincing than a former Russian traffic cop named Sergei Torop. In the woods of rural Siberia, he is known as Vissarion, the teacher, and around 5,000 disciples live around him, growing their own food and feasting on his every word. And my whole body was trembling. The trembling is not coming again. <laughs> well, it's a, a very emotional to me. Meanwhile, in London, David Shaler says he is the true Lord of Lords, but unlike Vissarion, no one believes him. That doesn't bother me because I was chosen by God. The former British intelligence agent says his body was filled with the spirit of Jesus in 2007, a conviction which intensifies on a visit to Jerusalem. We're in the Church Holy Sepulchre and this behind me is supposed to be the tomb of Christ. Well, I'm Christ, I'm not in the tomb, I'm not dead yet. But with no support, he lives in a squatter's camp outside London. By agreement with Jesus, I don't ask for money off people. If you're the Messiah, you shouldn't be asking for money. You should have faith that God will look after you. Prove to me that you are a son of God. But that is not a sentiment shared by Pastor Apollo Quibbeloy, the most successful of the world's self-labeled saviors. The official coming of the Son of God was in April 13, 2005. He was an obscure evangelist from the rural Philippines until 2005 when he announced that God had appointed him Christ on earth, his reward for a pure life. Sinful thoughts, uh, anger, lust, any of those things, you don't experience those on a daily basis? As a human being? Yes. I have all, already overcome all of those. There is no apocalypse in Kibaloi's message, no rapture or final judgment. Instead, he preaches that he is the model of Christianity. And as more people follow his example, God will gradually turn the earth back into the Garden of Eden. Do you perform miracles? For me, the greatest miracle is the changing of that spirit within. But healing the sick, the manifestations oh, yes, of Jesus' yes. powers, you, you, you're able to we do are, that? We have, we have healing. We you have are healing. Healing and miracles happening. Very convincing, right? Oh, what, what, what do you think? And by the way, if you are watching a playback of our live stream, uh, the clip might be muted because of copyright purposes. Um, the original link will be in our video description. But, you know, to claim that you are Jesus, that you are God, is pretty out there. Now, putting aside these human claims, I want to go back to the claim of Jesus himself. Uh, he says... Before Abraham was, I am. That statement claiming that he is God is very, very loaded. Especially when you hear a lot of people these days claiming Jesus to be just a teacher, to be just a good man. You know, I, I remember seeing and reading and hearing about various celebrities saying, Oh yeah, Jesus, yeah, he was a nice guy. You know, he was, a, he was, a, he was, he was wise. And then sure he was. But according to C.S. Lewis, a renowned Christian author, uh, he puts it this way. He says, I am trying to prevent anyone saying the really foolish thing that people often say about him. I'm ready to accept Jesus as a great moral teacher, but I cannot, but I don't accept his claim to be God. 
That is the one thing we must not say. A man who was merely a man and said the sort of things Jesus said would not be a great moral teacher. He would either be a lunatic. Uh, sorry, he would either be a lunatic on the level with the man who says he's a poached egg, or else he would be the devil of hell. C.S. Lewis continues. He says, you must make your choice. Either this man was and is the son of God, or else a madman or something worse. You can shut him up for a fool, you can spit at him and kill him as a demon, or you can fall at his feet and call him Lord and God. But let us not come with any patronizing nonsense about his being a great human teacher. He has not left that open to us. He did not intend to. Strong words. Uh, John Duncan simplifies this statement a little bit more with this. He says, Christ either deceived mankind by conscious fraud, or he was himself deluded and self-deceived, or he was divine. There is no getting out of this trilemma. It is inexor inexorable. So John Duncan calls it the trilemma. He is either one of three things, if you follow logic, not just Christian logic, um, the fact that Jesus says, I am, you're left with only three choices. He's either crazy, he's a lunatic, he's a liar, or he's who he claimed he is, he's Lord. You know, in modern times, there is an additional dimension. Um, people have denied the actual existence of Jesus. So, so much so that instead of a trilemma, we have what is called a quadrilemma. There's four things. And it basically looks something like this. We'll start, I guess, with this relatively modern claim that Jesus did not exist. He did not claim to be God. It's a flow chart here. Just follow him here as we go through this. So if Jesus did not exist, he did not claim to be God, then he is a legend. Um, right on the level of Bigfoot or the Loch Ness Monster, you know, things that exist in people's, people's minds with no substantial proof, though that does not stop people from looking. That's another topic for another day. And then we go to John uh, Duncan and C.S. Lewis's assertion that Jesus, yes, he did claim to be God, in which case, logically speaking, there are two options. It's either false or it's true. Now, if it was false, then, the fact that he says, I am, the fact that he says that I am God, that means he's either a lunatic, because it's a crazy assertion to claim that I am God. He knew he wasn't, but he said he was, then he would be a liar. Now, if it was true that his claim to be God is true, then we are left with the option that he is Lord, that he is who he says he is. So that is the gist of our discussion for today. It's actually uh, in three parts. Part one is just basically setting it up, everything that we've discussed so far already. Part two will cover the legend part, and I consider this to be more of an intellectual exercise. And part three is when we'll cover the rest. Um, if you've tuned in, you know, and you don't share the Christian faith, you're probably thinking, okay, I've watched for about 10, 20 minutes, 15 minutes now. I know how this is going to end. Um, he's a pastor. Of course, he's going to defend his faith and justify it at all costs. Well, you'd be right and you'd be wrong. Why do I say that? You see, I wasn't one of those Christians, you may have met them, where the truth was kind of like beaten into them, so to speak. You know, you hear of Christians who are told to believe just because. Well, I am actually not one of those. In fact, I know just about all the folks in one Turner. I don't believe many of them, maybe all of them are like that at all. That you're supposed to believe just because your parents told you so. I, for one, in fact, grew up as an atheist, uh, and I didn't step foot in the church until I was in my teens. 
that's another story for another time. I have sort of a more logical mindset. That's how my brain works because I, I work in IT. I used to work uh, for years in Colesmire when they were a company. I worked for MYOB. I worked for IBM. And as I journey, I ask questions like lots of them. You know, I could easily preach an entire sermon about the authenticity of the Bible, but the fact that you're listening means that at some level you are maybe willing to give the Bible a shot and you're willing to ask questions that the Bible, at the very least, is a historical book that has stood the test of time. Now, I don't believe for a second that faith requires blind obedience. We actually can look at the Bible intellectually and we can ask questions. So, we will ask questions today in this part two of our three, uh, present, three part presentation today. Let's start, let's start with this one. Let's start with this one. We'll ask a simple question. Who is Jesus Christ? We can look at this as an intellectual exercise and we will to an extent. Um, who, who is Jesus Christ? You know, we, we have all sorts of conclusions about him. But in fact, in fact, you know what? Let's let's ask the quote unquote legend question. Did Jesus exist? This is the legend question because if Jesus didn't exist, he'd be a legend. Not like, whoa, he's a legend, mate. Um, because more like, is he a legend in that he didn't exist? Now, for those of you, for a lot of us watching this, uh, if you have the faith, you're like, that's a no brainer. But did you know that in the Soviet Union, uh, textbooks describe Jesus as a fictional character? And that is the assumption of many people who find a problem with Christianity. But here's the thing, though. Even though it's a question, uh, I personally can breathe a sigh of relief because that question has already been answered. Um... In the scholarly world. Now, I'm not just talking about Christian scholars. There are actually eight irrefutable facts about Jesus, uh, no matter who you ask in terms of the scholarly world, and not just some blogger you find on the internet. So I'm just going to fly through them really, really quickly. If you want references, I can provide them to you. These are eight indisputable, irrefutable facts. Jesus was baptized by John the Baptist. Jesus was a Galilean who preached and healed. Jesus called disciples and spoke of their being. Jesus confined his activity to Israel. Jesus engaged in controversy about the temple. Jesus was crucified outside Jerusalem by the Roman authorities. After his death, Jesus' followers continued as an, un as an identifiable movement. At least some Jews persecuted at least parts of the new movement, and it appears that this persecution endured at least to a time near the end of Paul's career. So historically, whether you are of the faith or not, you can't deny the, the existence of Jesus. Um, it becomes quite astounding when you're able to go further and deeper into what the Bible says, let me just give you a short intellectual, I guess, discourse, if you want to call it that. Many people consider it a scholarly and historical fact that the newest book, newest book in the Old Testament, is the book of Malachi and Nehemiah, which was in at least 400 BC, so at least four to five centuries um, before Jesus was born. Um, now, if you look at the Old Testament, there are actually 125 prophecies pointing to the Messiah. If we're able to accept these incredible prophetic elements of the Bible, and really, um, if you look hard enough, uh, it's there. I, I, I'm going to give you some of these prophecies very quickly. I'm not going to go in through uh, them today. I'm just going to fly through these. So, he was born in Bethlehem. The Old Testament scripture, the Old Testament prophecies, Micah 5 verse 2. And it was fulfilled in Matthew 2 and verse 1. He was born of a virgin in Isaiah 7. That was prophesied and it was fulfilled in Matthew 1. 
And here's the rest of it, he was of David's lineage, attempted murder by Herod, betrayal by a friend, sold for 30 silver coins, he was crucified, lots were cast for his clothes, no bones were broken, buried in rich man's tomb, year day hour of his death, uh, and raised on the third day. Now this is just 12 of the 125 prophecies, as I mentioned. So, someone much smarter than me, and I know, I know, you're gonna say that's not really hard, but I'm telling you, this guy is smart, this guy I'm about to tell you. Uh, he, it's, he's so smart, you would have to spell S-E-M-A-R-T to describe him. He, he decided to work on some of these prophecies. Um, his name is Dr. Peter Stoner. Don't let the name fool you. Here's a little bit about him. He's a mathematician. He was the former chairman of the Department of Mathematics, Astronomy and Engineering at Pasadena College, California. He worked with 600 students for several years. Uh, on this project, he applied the principle of probability to the prophecies of the Messiah's coming, and he simply chose eight prophecies. Just eight out of the 125. The first of the eight prophecies he chose was Micah 5 and verse 2. Listen to this. This prophecy predicts that the Christ is to be born in Bethlehem. Since this is the first prophecy to be considered, there are no previously set restrictions, so our question is this. One man in how many the world ever has been born in Bethlehem? I know some of you are like, uh, what do I? Just, 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 just stay with me, just stay with me, okay? The best estimate which we can make of this comes from the attempt to find out the average population of Bethlehem from Micah down to the present time and divided by the average population of the earth during the same period. One member of the class was an assistant in the library, so he was assigned to get this information. He reported at the next meeting that the best determination of the ratio that he could determine was 1 to 280,000. I may have lost you already, but, but stick with me, stick with me. We're going to jump to the conclusion, alright? This is just his methodology. Now, since the probable population of the Earth has averaged less than 2 billion, the population of Bethlehem has averaged less than 7,150, our answer may be expressed in the form that one man in 7150 divided by blah 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 was born in Bethlehem. If you didn't get any of that, that, that that's the article there, I can point you to it. Someone much smarter than I. He would then apply the same concept to eight prophecies. Just the eight prophecies out of 125, he says the probability of eight prophecies being fulfilled is one in... That's 28 zeros. Do you know the odds of winning Tax Lotto in Australia is one in 3.8 million? That's only six zeros. According to Dr. Peter Stoner, the probability of eight prophecies being fulfilled is one in, I don't even know what that is, one in 28 zeros. And Dr. Stoner is effectively saying we can mathematically say that Jesus is who he says he is, and yet, some of you would have read this book, watched the movie, uh, The Da Vinci Code. Dan Brown says that the godness of Jesus, he's not God, he claimed it, but it was actually only conferred to him in the Council of Nicaea in 325 AD. Now, anyone watch the movie starring Tom Hanks, The Da Vinci Code? It's quite a fascinating tale. It's quite riveting. You know, Tom Hanks won many Oscars, Emmys, and Golden Globes. I don't know how many. I guess because of his ability to make the unreal, the unbelievable, believable. Now, Dan Brown claims to have done research, but many were quick to refute him. I'm just going to read just one. The common claim today is that belief in G is that belief in Jesus as a unique divine person arose long after he walked the earth. 
Such books as the Da Vinci Code have popularized the notion that it was not until the Council of Nicaea, three centuries after Jesus, that Christians started worshipping him as the divine son of God. Yet as it turned out, the best historical scholarship shows that simply, that simply is not the case. Well, that's the truth. But the truth doesn't always sell books uh, or get made into movies. You know, imagine a movie that says, oh, Jesus existed. Oh, I believe. Oh, the end. Um, Amy R. Ewing uh, talks about this legend component in a full sermon. You can Google her and I can share my resources with you. But this legend claim isn't hard to disprove or refute. It's, it's an intellectual exercise. There's plenty of evidence out there. But when you apply a bit of common sense and go into the right assumptions, the answers are there. Jesus was not a legend and I could go on. But here's the thing. But here's the thing. Even if we, I guess, cross out this first component that Jesus was not a legend, we have three more. And we come to the final part of our presentation today. And if you're watching this, you're probably going, you know what I'm going to say. I mean, I'm a pastor. You are tuned into a church channel. You already know the ending to the movie. Well, as we come into the final part of our presentation today, I want to go back to this question. Who is Jesus Christ? And I want to maybe add an additional component to this. Who is Jesus Christ to me? You know, oftentimes we've already made up a, my, our minds about something. And we interpret everything according to that. Richard Dawkins, um, in addressing this trilemma, he, he, he can't, you know, he's an intellectual, right? So he can't deny the existence of Jesus. He says, you know, the trilemma, um, legend, uh, sorry, lunatic, liar, or Lord. Uh, Richard Dawkins says that there is a fourth possibility. And he says, it is one that is too obvious to, to not mention. And he said that, you know, Jesus was simply mistaken. You know, when he said that, oh, I am God, I am he made a mistake. How is that a plausible choice? How is that a plausible choice? I mean, it logically, it doesn't flow. But then when you look back at history, it seems like people have already made up their minds about him without even giving the chance to dig deeper. Now consider what he did when he was on this earth. I'm going to show you some pictures which are just artists' impressions of Jesus. And I'm actually going to take myself off screen entirely and oh, my lighting. Just as well my Corona green screen is working out. Um, but I'm going to take myself off screen entirely. Um, even from the bottom right. But I want you to, as we look at some of these photos, as I read some Bible verses, I want to invite you to consider what he did on this earth, the kind of things he said, the people he spoke to. You know, the Bible is actually clear. He loved the little children. He sat with them. He played with them. Jesus said, let the little children come to me and do not hinder them, for the kingdom of heaven belongs to such as these. 
You know, he ministered to those in need, those who most of us would probably give not give a second glance to the people that we would cross the road just to avoid, but not Jesus. The Bible says in Luke chapter 4 and verse 18, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me. Because He has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim freedom for the prisoners and recovery of sight for the blind to set the oppressed free. No, He was a healer. He was the best doctor anyone could ever ask for. The Bible says in Matthew 9 and verse 35, Jesus went through all the towns and villages, teaching in their synagogues, proclaiming the good news of the kingdom, and healing every disease and sickness. But he wasn't just a healer, he was a teacher, and when he spoke, spoke. Incredible things came out of his mouth. People listened and people wanted to make changes in their lives for the better. Matthew 7 and verse 29, the Bible says, Jesus, he taught as one who had authority and not as teachers of the law. But in spite of all that, there were those who said things like this. Many of them said, he is possessed and raving mad. Why listen to him? He is a lunatic. They took him before Pilate. They made a mockery of a trial. You know, Pilate soon comes under the conviction that Jesus is innocent, but Pilate didn't want to anger the people, so he ordered to have him flogged. You know, I, there are kids watching this and I don't want to be too graphic, but what you see on the screen right now is the cat of nine tails. There are shards of bone and metal that would rip into you. And they whipped him 39 times. They would put a bag around his head and beat him. And by the time he was carrying the cross, he was almost already dead. And as he was carrying the cross, he stumbled just so many times. His body was so badly broken and bruised. The soldiers had to get someone else to carry it for him. But eventually, eventually, he made it to that hill called Calvary. Where he was nailed to the cross. You know, the picture shows the rope around his arms with the nails through his hands. And they don't know for sure, but some say the nails probably went through the wrists. You don't die from the pain, you die from asphyxiation because you had to support yourself up to breathe. In Luke 23, the soldiers said, If you are the king of the Jews, save yourself! Some king you are, you are a liar! In Matthew 27, the chief priest, if you are the king of Israel, come down and will believe you are definitely a lie. Even the thief on the cross in Luke 23 and verse 39, save yourself, save us, liar. You know, if he truly was a liar, he'd probably just go, I I'm, I'm just kidding guys, bring me down. But you know what Jesus said? This is what he said. He said, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. For they know not what they do. You know, it doesn't matter what you may think of Jesus. Because he thinks the world of you. He loves you more than you can imagine. This thing called grace. No matter what you're going through. He says, come just as you are. You know, there's actually a lot of parallel to um, this thing to today. In Australia, we're celebrating Anzac Day. We remember those who died, those who 
willingly fought and sacrificed for us. We don't know these soldiers and yet we're thankful. As we close today, I'd like to extend an invitation to you. If you have never considered this Jesus and you've been bombarded by the fanatics who claim to know Jesus, you know, the so-called Christians who act like anything but Christians, I want to invite you to join us on this journey of discovering who God is. That you would reconsider and give him another look. And for those of you who already call him Lord, I'm thankful. Let us be reminded of the incredible sacrifice that he has made for us. The incredible sacrifice that he has done for us simply because he loves you and he loves me.